In Ludwig von Mises' intellectual testament memoirs, uh, he discusses his life and work in Europe prior to 1940. In that book, he reveals that he first read Karl Menger's book, Principles of Economics, around Christmas time in 1903. Quote, it was this book, Mises relates, that I became an economist. After reading this book, it's the thing that made him realize that there was economic theory and it was something that he could uh, study and uh, teach about and write about. Now, before that, in his first years at the University of Vienna, he was schooled in historicist interventionism. As Guido Holzman tells us, Mises began his studies a champion of interventionist statism. And although his turn toward free market liberalism, uh, classical liberalism, was not instantaneous, after reading Menger's principles, Mises would never be the same. I have much the same relationship with the book we are celebrating at this event, Mises' Human Action. When I encountered Mises' Human Action for the first time as a sophomore in college, I was not a historicist, I was not really an interventionist, and I definitely was not a statist. Uh, my family was a blue collar family. Uh, my dad worked in a meatpacking plant while my mother frugally managed the household budget. Without even knowing any formal economic principles, growing up I was practically schooled in comparisons of marginal cost and marginal benefit and maximizing utility uh, per dollar spent every day. Uh, not knowing what the discipline of economics was, I took my first microeconomics course as a freshman in college and was immediately impressed and interested in the sort of questions raised and in the sort of analysis undertaken in answering these questions. I was quickly drawn to economics as a major. I had lingering doubts, however, whether economics was rooted in reality or built merely on constructs so artificial that their conclusions were irrelevant to the real world. While pondering this question, I purchased my first copy of Mises' Human Action from the old conservative book club. I began to read it, and I was delighted to find that there is an economic framework rooted in reality, and hence worth devoting my life to studying and teaching. What Menger's principles was for Mises, Human Action was for me. It is the book that made me an economist. For the first time, uh, I should say, from the first time I began reading the first pages of Human Action, I found Mises' entire approach very refreshing. He begins not by looking at reams of descriptive statistics and GDP, a la Paul Samuelson. Uh, he doesn't even begin examining individual markets or the nature of wealth. Instead, he painstakingly lays out the very foundations of economics by examining in some detail the nature of human action. His effort pays uh, significant dividends in keeping his reader from potentially shipwrecking his economics on the rocky shoals of scientism. He refrains from constructing economic theories via abstract modeling built on unrealistic assumptions. He never models people as mere representative agents who are narrowly, selfishly uh, acting with perfect information. He does not assume benevolent and omnipotent economic planners. Consequently, the economist building on Mises is not deluded into thinking that economics is about developing elegant mathematical models that are irrelevant for the real world of uncertainty in which prices, quantities, efficient firm sizes, and market concentrations are arrived at through the real market process. Mises also steers clear of positivist nihilism. Mises' foundations allows him to develop economic theorems that are true economic laws, rather than hypothetical propositions always subject to being rejected by the next empirical test. The economic actors causing all economic phenomena are more than inanimate objects merely reacting to stimuli. They are more than biological creatures driven by instincts. In fact, better than anyone before him, Mises sets the action of real human beings as the foundation for economic science. And one of the hallmarks of Mises' human action is its logically consistent, systematic unfolding of economic law from the firm foundation of realistic human action. The methodological agnosticism of much of modern economics notwithstanding, this is no small matter. I have long thought that the foundations of economics are of key importance. 25 years ago, 
in a lecture at the Mises Institute celebrating the publication of the scholar's edition of Human Action, I noted that, quote, when a rocket is launched, if its trajectory is off target just a degree or two, it can miss its destination by miles. The same holds true with scholarship. When one sets out on the path of the academic, it is important that he is starting from a firm foundation and that his course is true, end quote. Now, this methodological point is far from being merely academic. The millions who have died of starvation and disease under socialist governments are testimony to that. And the tragic story of Robert Franklin Hoxie brings the importance of economic foundations to a very personal level. Hoxie was a labor economist at the University of Chicago from 1906 to 1916. And he was on the U.S. Commission on Industrial Relations from about 19, well, for the years 1914 and 15. So Hoxie was a, a relative big shot. Sadly for him, he was also a devotee of American institutionalist Thorstein Veblen. Now, his friend and colleague, Alvin Johnson, documents the damage faulty foundations can have for an economist. Johnson explained Hoxie's economic framework as follows, quote, Hoxie boasted that his whole system of thought came from Veblen. It was Veblen who had taught him that all ideas of reconciling the interests of labor and the employer were a fantastic delusion. For the minds of labor and of the employer were built on completely different philosophical elements, end of quote. Hoxie came to understand, however, that Veblen's economics was built on a rotten foundation, and the bad leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Alas, Hoxie was emotionally shattered. Johnson relates that on one sad day, Hoxie visited New York to where Johnson had relocated and asked Johnson to come to his hotel for the evening. Hoxie, quote, was frightening in his appearance. He told Johnson that he was finished. Quote, I can see now all my work has been bunk. All my writing, every lecture I have given has been bunk. When asked for the reason, Hoxie continued, I've come to see through Veblen. Hoxie told Johnson that he could not understand, quote, how could a man be so great a scientist and such a damn fool? And the more I thought, the more the idea wrote in my mind, how great a scientist is he? End of quote. Upon more cogitation, Hoxie concluded that Veblen knew that his equations didn't solve, but he used them just the same. This realization was devastating to Hoxie. He told Johnson, quote, I wouldn't care if it was just the matter of my finding out a phony I had taken for okay, but Veblen has been the premise of all my work. My work is all rotten with Veblenism. Hoxie understood that foundations do matter. Johnson conversed with Hoxie for eight hours, finally sufficiently calming him down enough for sleep. Johnson plaintively closes his narrative, writing, quote, I left him promising to visit him in Chicago and renew the discussion. But before I could get around to Chicago, the Chicago trip, Hoxie killed himself, end of quote. Now my point is not that economists who do not begin with human action as their foundation will eventually become suicidal. <laughs> On the other hand, why risk it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. No, no, my point is simply that foundations do matter, right? Hoxie came to this important realization, but he unfortunately could not find a positive way past his epiphany. People who begin with Mises uh, don't have to uh, risk that impulse. Uh, the analytical framework Mises perfects and set forth in human action is useful for all economics. Uh, it was the economic basis for my first book, Foundations of Economics. Uh, one of the most important questions I found that students of economics need to answer satisfactorily for themselves is whether the professor of economics is pulling the wool over their eyes. Uh, I needed to do so as a student, and I sense that my students need to do that as well. They need to apprehend that the laws of economics are actual laws and not merely necessary conclusions implied by artificial constructs dreamed up by academics. As I note in my Foundations of Economics, quote, the first six chapters of Mises' human uh, magnum opus, Human Action, provides the seminal explanation of the nature of human action and its implication for how we discover economic truth. Tying action to our nature as human beings 
Mises defines human action as purposeful behavior. People must apply means according to ideas to achieve ends because our means are scarce. Because means are scarce, we must choose to achieve some ends and leave other ends unfulfilled. When acting, people choose to do one thing while simultaneously choosing not to do something else. The choice then requires that we rank our ends, which necessitates preference. Action therefore requires valuation which in turn implies the concepts of benefit and cost, profit, and ultimately profit and loss. It implies the law of marginal utility and the laws of supply and demand so important for price determination. Now, about eight years after the publication of my first book, I turned my attention toward writing a book about the nature and causes of economic prosperity. I'd been prompted to consider this topic by uh, years before that uh, by a conversation I had with a graduate student who attended uh, Grove City College's Austrian Student Scholars Conference. He suggested to me uh, during lunch one day that while Austrians have a recognized business cycle theory, we don't have a recognized theory of economic development. Now, his claim was not that we do not have a theory of economic progress, but that it is not recognized as such. Now, after teaching economic expansion and development for about 20 years, my ideas on the subject had been uh, percolating, and I decided to uh, try to articulate a general theory of economic prosperity. And I naturally turned to Mises as a starting point in my research. Uh, the economic framework and insights of Mises point to a theory of economic progress more robust and relevant than his conventional macroeconomic counterparts. Mises' causal realist praxeological approach allows for the development of a more holistic theory of economic expansion development that therefore is more likely to provide helpful policy guidance for purposes of actual economic progress. Now, Mises is quite helpful at the beginning of this conversation with his very definition of economic progress. A progressing economy is one in which there is an increase in per capita wealth. He goes further, however, by helpfully noting that this wealth is subjective in its nature. He reminds us that, quote, goods, commodities, and wealth, and all the other notions of conduct are not elements of nature. They are elements of human meaning and conduct. He who wants to deal with them must look not at the external world, he must search for them in the meaning of acting men, end of quote. Wealth, therefore, is not merely stuff. Stuff, but not merely stuff. Uh, it is economic goods that are valued subjectively useful to attain ends by people using them. As such, wealth cannot be scientifically measured. That is not to say that we are unable to make any judgments about whether a society has or is enjoying economic progress. It is merely to say that we do this with what Mises calls, quote, historical understanding and not scientific measurement. We can observe people enjoying the use of more and better goods for lower prices. The question then becomes, how do we enjoy economic progress thus described? The answer is increases in productivity and the ability to use the fruits of our production according to our subjective purposes. Mises points to us to a uh, theory of economic progress in a discussion about whether monetary inflation increased general social welfare in history. He says this, quote, the question is whether the fall in purchasing power was or was not an indispensable factor in the evolution which led from the poverty of ages gone by to the more satisfactory conditions of modern Western capitalism. What is needed is a clarification of the effects of changes in the purchasing power on the division of labor, the accumulation of capital, and technological improvement." End quote. Those are the three processes that result in economic progress, expansion of the division of labor, capital accumulation, and improvement in technology. Mises has much to say about all three. We've already seen uh, just from Paul Swick just a few minutes ago that the division of labor opens the door to increased productivity by allowing people to specialize in production according to efficiency. And this increased productivity results in higher real incomes and higher societal wealth. Now, while Mises was not, of course, the first to recognize the contribution of the division, uh, the division of labor to prosperity, he emphasizes several points about exchange and the division of labor that are innovative. Uh, one, as Swick noted, is his expanding David Ricardo's law of comparative advantage to that of a full-fledged law of association. 
It is not only that different countries with different opportunity costs in the production of various goods could benefit from specialization and exchange. What is true of people in different countries is true of everyone, everywhere trade occurs. Mises also understood that the division of labor and human cooperation is the fundamental social phenomenon. He saw the division of labor as that social tie that with reason and language are uniquely human. In so doing, he also explicitly rejects social Darwinism as the theory for the development of society. Society is not a competitive struggle for survival. It is the product of cooperation, not conflict. Social Darwinism, on the other hand, is a, social of, uh, is a theory of anti-social devolution. In addition to an expanding market division of labor, Mises explains that a progressing economy is actuated by an increase in available productive capital goods. The use of capital goods contributes to economic progress by increasing the productivity of the user. However, before capital goods can be used, they must first be produced. In order to accumulate capital, people must be willing to put off present consumption so that they will have resources available to invest in the production of capital goods. As Mises explains, quote, saving is the first step on the way toward improvement of material well-being and toward every further progress on this way, end of quote. Another important yet underappreciated uh, contribution in Mises' human action is his conception of capital itself. Mises conceives of capital as a tool of economic calculation and defines it as the sum of the whole complex of goods destined for acquisition evaluated in money terms. Capital, therefore, is neither <clears throat> merely a fund, of, a fund of investable money nor merely a stock of physical capital goods. As Mises explains, quote, there is no such thing as an abstract or ideal capital that exists apart from concrete capital goods. Capital is always embodied in definite capital goods and is affected by everything that happens with regard to them. The value of an amount of capital is derivative of the value of the capital goods in which it is, in, is embodied. As the value of an entrepreneur's capital goods go, therefore goes... Uh, so goes his capital. This helps explain why capital spending per se does not necessarily contribute to economic prosperity. Invest investment must be spent on specific capital goods allocated toward the production of those specific goods that can be sold for profit because only then can the capital uh, goods maintain or increase their capital value. Another insight from Mises is that technology does not determine the entrepreneur's production technique. Rather, it is, quote, his supply of capital goods available at the moment that determines which of the many known technological methods of production will be employed. What holds back underdeveloped countries, such as Romania in the 1800s, was not a lack of technical knowledge, Mises explained but the quantity of capital goods needed to put the technology in practice. Indeed, because capital is scarce, there is always unused technology that could be applied toward the attainment of some end, but must remain uh, unmet because of a lack of necessary capital goods embodying that technology. Now, when uh, concerning the speed uh, with which society enjoys the benefits from technical advance, he similarly notes, quote, what slows down technological improvement is not the imperfect convertibility of capital goods, but their scarcity. We are not rich enough to renounce the services which still utilizable capital goods could provide. Now, finally, throughout human action is a recognition that the market division of labor capital accumulation, and the use of technology all require wise entrepreneurial judgment for economic progress to result, as Peter Klein mentioned. Entrepreneurship, therefore, is a fourth contributor to economic progress. Entrepreneurship is important because to sustain economic progress over time, it is important not to waste capital that has already been accumulated. Right? Accumulating capital is necessary, but Capital invest could always be wasted. We always squander it on uh, investments that don't pan out 
and producing goods, uh, pro uh, products that are wasteful. That's, that's one reason why, for instance, when uh, people like Paul Samuelson was touting the productivity of the Soviet Union because they produced you know, three times more concrete that was necessary. Right? That was not productive activity. It was wasteful activity because there were scarce resources poured into the production of concrete that could have been used to produce other things like, you know, houses and clothing and cars and maybe more than one color. Who knows? Um, so entrepreneurship is important because it is important not to waste a capital that has already been accumulated. Production decisions in the present are based on a forecast of future market conditions. And if the producer forecasts incorrectly, he will use his capital to produce goods that will not return a profit. Right? And that would be a signal that he has wasted those resources. If, on the other hand, the entrepreneur obtains ownership of land, labor, and capital goods, or use of land, labor, and capital goods, and directs them to producing goods uh, that are uh, actually demanded by uh, consumers in the future, then they will be able to sell those goods for a price that covers their cost of production. They will reap a profit, and that is a signal that they have used those goods uh, productively. And by using those goods productively, those entrepreneurs contribute to economic progress. Now, Mises famously showed that entrepreneurs need to use economic calculation if they are to direct factors of production toward their most valued uses. It was mentioned by Joe Salerno earlier today. Market prices allow entrepreneurs to make meaningful comparisons of social value between different consumers and the producer goods because the money prices for both the consumer goods and the uh, producer goods are all expressed in terms of the same good, the monetary unit, right? We're not comparing, say, uh, two by fours, a certain quantity of two by fours and shingles and nails and carpet and drywall and then a house, right? We're comparing the, mar the, the sum of the price of all the factors it takes to produce the house with the price of the house that we can sell the house for, which is a that's, that's an example of a long sentence for me that's not properly constructed. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry you had to uh, endure that. Uh, the, the point is the, the entrepreneur can make those meaningful comparisons because the prices of the product are in the same units as the prices of the factors of production. And so when the entrepreneur calculates profit and loss, they can make meaningful objective comparisons. And the beauty of the market price system, however, is that these same objective prices that are in the same monetary unit are determined by the subjective preferences of the buyers and sellers. So if the expected price of the final product is greater than the sum of the price of factors of production, the entrepreneur will produce the good. If the contractor thinks I can sell this house for $250,000 and it's only going to cost me $200,000 to, to produce, I could get a profit, I produce the house. And if it turns out that he, he does sell the house for $250,000, he reaps a profit. And if he reaps a profit, the entrepreneur who reaps a profit does it precisely by providing those goods that people value the most in the least costly manner. Right? Sort of as an aside, one of the things that Mises helps sort of um, refute is this canard uh, trumped up by the Marxists and, you know, the modern progressives that one of the big um, bugaboos of capitalism is that uh, production is for profit, not for use. But in a market economy, the only lines of production that are profitable are the production of those goods that people actually want to use, right? So in a free market, production for profit is production for use. And so when entrepreneurs reap a profit, they do it precisely for doing what people want them to do, other people want them to do. As Paul Swick says, they earn a profit for serving other people. Right? Now, one cannot neatly sever the components responsible for economic expansion from one another and find a single key, one thing that explains economic progress. Um, a highly developed division of labor, for example, uh, would be impossible without the accumulation and use of capital goods. Likewise, the entrepreneur must invest real capital in the production process. And if he errs in his market forecast, he can reap large losses. At the same time, capital per se never guarantees economic progress either um, because it must be widely utilized. Right? Uh, one of my 
favorite sentences in all of human action is uh, capital does not beget profit, right? Just having capital invested in it doesn't mean you're gonna be, it's gonna be profitable, right? It has to be wise, wisely utilized, it has to be wisely invested. So economic progress is the happy consequence of a highly developed division of labor taking advantage of an increasing capital stock embodying economically appropriate technology wisely invested by entrepreneurs. Consequently, Mises tells us that if we want a society to benefit from economic expansion, we need social institutions that foster the development of the division of labor, the accumulation of capital, technological improvement, and successful entrepreneurship. Searching for a common condition that is necessary for all of the above to function, one finds that all require the social institutions of private property and sound money. People can only benefit from the division of labor if they are free to exchange the goods that they produce. We will benefit from the division of labor, therefore, only if dwelling in a society with institutions supporting voluntary trade. And we can only engage in exchange in an environment of private property. You cannot trade what you do not own. Likewise, for capitalists to have the incentive to accumulate capital, they must be secure in their property. If, for example, the state enforces confiscatory taxation, regulation of business, and price controls, capital accumulation is hindered. Capital consumption occurs. Taxes, for instance, reduce the ability and incentive to save and invest. Regulations and price controls direct capital away from their most highly valued ends. Capital consumption occurs, productivity declines, we are all left relatively impoverished. The entrepreneurs need for money, uh, monetary market prices to calculate profit and loss also point to the necessity of private property and sound money for entrepreneurship. Only voluntary prices are manifestations of the subjective preferences of the buyers and sellers in society. Without voluntary exchange, there can be neither money nor market prices. Falsification of prices due to monetary inflation at best leads entrepreneurs astray and at worst leaves them paralyzed. Without rational economic calculation, those directing the allocation of factors of production have no way to allocate them wisely. Capital, again, is consumed and standards of living fall. In short, one of the great lessons of Mises' human action is that the institutions of the free society, private property and sound money, make up the environment enabling economic progress and hence economic flourishing. Thank you.